Okay, so uh, today uh, we're covering chapter two. Um, I'm gonna do some really quick review with you guys from chapter one. Um, so you guys can get some refresher real quick. So I'm gonna ask you some questions and on your, um, on the chat uh, option, uh, I want you guys to respond. So let me actually look for the chat option here. Oh, here it is. Okay, there you go. Okay, so um, the first question I have for you guys is, tell me the three basic characteristics uh, of science. Tell me the three basic characteristics of science. There's three basic characteristics of science. Thank you, Philip. All right, moving on to the next one. Um, tell me the, the attitudes of science. What are the attitudes of science? The attitudes of science. Okay, can you guys type them out real quick? So what are the attitudes of science? Okay, that's one, I got good stuff. Determinism. Good, empiricism. Parsimony, good, Oscar. All right, Phil, <laughs> thanks for just providing all of us. And there, uh, there's actually, yeah, philosophical doubt. Good job, so overall, those are the different, um, you know, basically attitudes of science that you guys need to remember. So make sure to, to uh, continue building uh, fluency uh, with these different, ter uh, you know, terms. Uh, we still have a few more questions I have on this on this other section we, we had. We also want to know uh, what are the three um, you know branches of uh, behavior analysis? What are the three branches of behavior analysis? So go ahead and type your answers. Okay, so I see there ABA. Uh, I see EAB and also see theoretical. I would like for you guys to, uh, instead of theoretical, I would like for you guys to say behaviorism, okay? That's just being more technical, so just say behaviorism, but it is more or less synonymous with one another, so theoretical and behaviorism, um, but good. So moving on to the next question is, um, what is radical behaviorism? You know, what is beha radical behaviorism? What does that encompass? What kind of behavior does radical behaviorism encompass? Okay, so I said all behaviors. Can you guys be a bit more descriptive? I said a really important, you know, uh, you know, way of describing this. Um, so inert and inert and covert. Okay. And I want uh, if you guys can memorize this right here. If you guys can can say uh, all inclusive. Okay. All inclusive. So radical behaviorism encompasses all. Is basically all inclusive. All right. Perfect. All right. So let's move on to the next thing. Let's see if there's anything else. Um. Can you guys give me a definition of applied behavior analysis? What is applied behavior analysis? What do we do with applied behavior analysis? What is it? What is applied behavior analysis? Okay, good job, Aya. I like what you said. Socially significant behavior. Philip said understanding and improving human behavior. Good, uh, Philip. Uh, and it is sci it's a science, so basically a combination of all those different things you mentioned there. All right, so as long as you guys remember that, that applied behavior analysis is one of the branches of behavior analysis. And definitely it's, um, you know, like Oscar just mentioned now, it's a science to improve behavior. Okay. All right, moving on to the next one. Um, and this is very critical here, so uh, I want all of you guys to respond to this question. Uh, what are the seven dimensions of behavior analysis? What are the seven dimensions of behavior analysis? Okay, so I see behavioral, I see um, applied, analytic, good. Analytical, good. Generality, effective, technological, good. Effective, okay. All right, perfect. So you guys got them down. So uh, just, to, just to summarize, we have applied, behavioral, analytic, technological, conceptually systematic, effective, and 
we talked about also uh, generality, okay? So uh, question for you guys, uh, which of these dimensions uh, fall on the lines of uh, experimentation? Which actually fulfills uh, experimentation? Which of these dimensions talks about experimentation or focuses on experimentation? Which one of these uh, dimensions is the basis or the focus of the uh, perfect analytical? I always say that, that, that the analytical dimension is essential. It's really, really important to remember that we are a science, and as science, we need to be analyzing, right? We need to be always looking at cause and effect, right? And part of the process is experimentation. I have to reiterate a lot of times people don't do that. People, you know, in general in our field, uh, you know, have their bag of tricks and uh, they think that they can be able to utilize their bag of tricks across the board, and it's not. You know, uh, the true essence of the science is to be able to, you know, problem solve, analyze, review what's going on, you know, analyze the environment, see what's going on in the environment to make those modifications. So that's really what a true behavior analyst does. All right. And another really important one is, uh, can you guys tell me the, uh, the dimension of the seven, one of the seven dimensions that actually covers uh, the whole aspect of uh, the principles, you know, something that ties up the principles of behavior analysis? Wh which of the dimension ties in the principles of behavior analysis? Correct. Oh, yeah. Conceptually systematic, absolutely. So when you are able to combine analytic and then conceptually systematic, we have a strong behavior analyst. Okay, and conceptual systematic is basically someone that is really truly understanding the principles uh, of reinforcement. I talked about that we have reinforcement, punishment, extinction. Uh, you know, we have discrimination, uh, generalization. All these different principles are really, really, really important for all of you guys to have really strong fluency with. Um, you know, that that's basically the the way that you guys are going to be able to understand the phenomena that you're studying. Um, like I said, there's unfortunately there's a lack of fluency sometimes in really understanding these things. But if you're able to utilize once again the whole or understand the whole uh, dimension of analytic and conceptual systematic, then you you're really really hitting the marks in regards to being a, a better behavior analyst. All right. So more or less uh, that covers you know what you know we covered last week, which is basically a really quick review of, of chapter one. Uh, today we're going to talk about chapter two, uh, which is the basic uh, concepts. Um, you know, some of you guys have been taught, you know, basic concepts in the past, you know, uh, you know, some, some of you by me um, and some of you by other instructors. Um, so I think that overall, you know, I want you guys to take some notes today. So that's why, um, aside from not actually have, finding the study guide, I would like for you guys to like, you know, write down the way that I just uh, like to de uh, define these different, um, you know, uh, concepts. Okay. So. Let's start off with the first one, and the first one should be an obvious one, right? The first one should be behavior, right? Behavior, um, you know, what is behavior? Can you guys define what behavior is? What is behavior? Okay, so Oscar said a person's interaction with their environment, so I the same thing, okay. Any other responses? Any movement from the organism, Johnny? Good. Okay. Yeah. So you guys are more or less, uh, you know, hitting it there. So uh, Gabriel said anything observed or measured activity from living organisms. So you guys are all hitting it, right? We we talk about behavior in all these different, you know, forms that you guys just mentioned. Now, um, the way that I like to keep it is simple. I like to say that behavior is anything someone does. Simple. All right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if, if anything, you know, that right there provides you with, once again with the basis that, you know, when we talked about radical behaviorism, right, we talked about all-inclusive behavior. So here we have, you know, behavior defined as anything someone does. Okay? Very plain and simple. Now, aside from that, we need to understand that behavior occurs in the environment, right? So behavior occurs in the environment. So absolutely, we know that, right? That behavior needs to occur in the environment. That has to happen, right? Or else we can't be able to, you know, really make account for that. Now, the next thing to remember is that behavior uh, does does not occur vacuum. And what I mean by that is I'm not mean vacuum the ones you use to clean your house. I mean, basically, that behavior is something that comes in contact with all types of phenomena. And it's everywhere, pretty much. There's, there's uh, Everything occurs. You know, there's always something going on. Um, and I think that uh, Gabriel mentioned something really important. He said, you know, behavior is something that needs to be observable. All right. But 
also may, keep in mind that some of the behavior that, that we do, uh, you know, take into account is not observable, right? So we talked about the private events, um, you know, anything that, you know, anything that has to do with, um, you know, internal, uh, you know, movement or things that happen uh, are things that also are, are taken into account, right, as a field. And that's where it gets really complicated sometimes, right, where we say, okay, well, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, analyze, how do we assess, you know, behavior that's unobservable? And at the end of the day, you know, it definitely comes, uh, it, it becomes the, the, you know, the behavior Allen's job to try to find ways, right? To try to find, identify uh, any, types, any types of responses that occur that correspond to that particular, you know, thing that they're mentioning, right? Private events is one very, very particular one that everybody has. We also have, you know, the whole aspect of, you know, thoughts, right? Ideas, you know, we have imagining, imagination. We have, you know, all these things, dreams, you know, all these things are considered more or less, you know, also behavior, right? So for now, I want you guys just to remember that behavior is basically anything someone does. All right, so that's very, very, pretty much straight to the to the point. Um, so moving on to the next thing. So far, we we have that uh, response, right? Response versus response class. Can you guys tell me what the difference is be, uh, between response versus response class? What, what is what is what is the difference between these two? Okay, it's Johnny, good job. So you said response is a single response. I mean, one single thing that occurs. Excellent. So we have response, and Ritz is the same thing. So response is basically an instance of behavior. Response class is a group of responses. There you go. So that's very, very pretty much straight to the point there. Uh, as behavior analysts, right, we focus on response classes, right? Response classes is basically the, our focal point. Why? Because we try to look at the functional relations, right? The behaviors that occur in the past or occurring right now are not going to be able to be repeated in the future. What I mean by that is the fact that if right now I, you know, use my phone, right? I turn my phone on. Uh, in the future, when I try to turn my phone on, I'm not going to be able to replicate the same exact motion that I did, you know, in that previous response. All right. So what I do have, though, is a set of responses that definitely serve the same function, right? It's all about functionality. Uh, in response classes, that's what it does. That's why when we talk about, you know, operational definitions, you guys are essentially, you know, uh, having a response class. You guys are defining a response class, right? Uh, some of our, our individuals that we work with have response classes that consist of, like, you know, crying, elopement, um, I don't know, aggression. And all of them serve maybe the function of escape, right? So, you know, on our end, we try to include it, right, all inclusive in regards to that particular response class so we can be able to analyze it right on that end. Uh, so sometimes what I've noticed is that when we have a uh, definition, right, or in general, like a topography based uh, definition, I've seen uh, some, uh, some reports that say uh, self injurious behavior, right, SIB. Um, and that's okay. I mean, SIB is, is, is obviously good to, to, to mention. So you have SIB, you may have something like tantrums. Um, but the problem with this right here, the main problem, you know, with, with defining behavior this way is, is that you're looking at behavior as a topography, right? And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the topography versus, you know, the function, right? Um, and we notice that there's huge, huge, um, you know, deficits. There's a huge lack of, you know, actually being analytical when you look at things as a topography only, right? A lot of times I've seen people collect, uh, you know, tallies or, or frequency counts of behavior. Uh, and, and that in itself, it's, it's problematic if you're looking, if you're trying to assess the, the main, you know, uh, thing that we should be looking at, which is function, right? So what I'm trying to say is that rather than focus on response, we need to focus on response class. And when you're, when you are looking at, at very specific types of, of, uh, responses, you're focusing on that versus rather than the response class. And that's a problem. Uh, so, uh, once again, this is something a lot of people don't cover, you know, a lot of, you know, times we're, we're trained to say, oh yeah, or people train you and say, look, you got to take, uh, you know, tally for each instance, or you gotta, you gotta take a frequency count, et cetera. And, you know, the problem with that, once again, is you're really not accounting for the function. And that's where you have, you know, never ending programs. You have, you know, kids that are working with you for years and you don't see any progress. Well, the biggest issue is that you really have not been able to, to, to look at the main thing you need to look at, which is the function. So that's why I say it's really critical for you guys to know the difference between response and response class and the fact that as behavior analysts, we do focus on response class rather than the, the one single response, okay? All right, so 
let's see if there's anything else on, on this domain. Um, on your So if you guys have your, your Cooper book uh, open right now, I think you guys should. Um, if you guys can go to page 27, uh, page 27 on the second paragraph um, on the left side, uh, there's a word right there that we utilize a lot in our field, and that's repertoire. Uh, repertoire is basically, um, you know, it pretty much anything someone does, right? We talk about the repertoire is basically a collection of responses, right, that, that individuals engage in or a set of skills. Thank you, Ritz, that people engage in. So more or less, you know, you have a repertoire for clinical skills, right? You guys have a whole set of, of, of different skills that you utilize, uh, you know, when you're working in the field of behavior analysis. You all have a, you know, a set of skills that you utilize when interacting with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your wife or your husband. Uh, we, we all have different sets of skills that we utilize that are all about, you know, survival, right? Uh, that have helped us, you know, in general, uh, you know, assimilate to those particular situations. Um, you know, and that's really what repertoire is. Repertoire, a lot of times, you know, and like I said, this is closed-minded, very, very um, not looking at the big picture perspective of behavior analysis is that say, oh, you know, repertoire is, is basically, you know, when the child, everything the child does, but it's not really that. I mean, it's basically all the things that you guys do too. You know, all the things that you guys do, all the things that I do, everything that, you know, that we engage in basically is repertoire. We have different sets of repertoires that we engage in, once again, for survival reasons. You know, these behaviors have been reinforced in different situations and that allows us to continue and continue receiving reinforcement, right? And that's why we continue doing it. So that's more or less what, you know, when we talk about repertoire. Then I get on to a really critical thing here, environment, okay? Um, I want the class to tell me what environment is. What do you guys think environment is? <clears throat> All right, so I'm getting a setting, context. Okay, is there anything else that you guys can think of in regards to environment? What is environment? Okay, so the setting in which behavior takes place, what surrounds an organism, okay. where the behavior occurs. All right, so I want you guys, I want you guys to 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 uh, open, you know, and 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 pay really close attention to what I'm gonna the definition I'm gonna tell you guys. Okay, this definition is gonna really change the way you guys view environment. So environment is basically all stimuli that affect behavior. In a given given moment, okay. Once again, environments all stimuli that affect behavior in a given moment. So, for example, right now I'm talking to you guys here in front of my computer. You guys are responding. And, you know, there's different things going on. Okay. Um, outside right now, outside my 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 office, there's cars. So I see a bunch of you know, there's a bunch of cars. I hear you know, there's there's different sounds going on. Outside my office, there's a bunch of sounds going on. Um, now the question, the question that I have is, do these sounds, do these movements around me affect my behavior? Do they affect my behavior? Do they, do they make me do something different as we stand right now, as I speak to you guys? Do they really evoke a response? So for instance, if I'm, if I'm hearing a sound out there, you know, do I get up and I, do I go look out the window every time that I hear a car, every time I, 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 I see something passing by, do I, do I look out there, out there the window? Um, you know, do I, uh, you know, cause that's a question. Once again, do they actually evoke a, ch a change, right? A response that they gave me, a, get, they gave me away from what I'm doing right now with you guys to go look somewhere else. Are they evoking responses right now? Is that stimuli or that's things that are going on outside? Do they actually evoke something right now as we speak? Let's think about it. Okay. So I said, no. Okay. Who else agrees with Aya? You know, who else, who else says no? Okay, Judy says in some instances. Okay, Oscar. Okay, good. So you 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 brought up you brought up a good point there. So you said if it's too noisy, it does, right? Yeah, absolutely. So for instance, right? Let's say right now that I am you know talking to you guys, and you know next door I have a bunch of people working doing different things, but one of them all of a sudden turns on their music so loud that I really can't you know I can't even talk to you guys. I can't even pay attention to to you guys. I'm, I'm totally lost. Then at that point. If I, you know, at that point, I will probably, it will evoke some type of response. I will get up and I go say, hey, turn the music down, guys. I'm trying to, you know, work here with, with the, you know, with the BCBA study, study group. So in that situation, you know, the stimuli there evokes something, right? It changed something. It made, a, it made some type of 
um, you know, it made me <laughs> engage in some type of response. And that's what happens. We have stimuli uh, or in, in situations that occur around us all the time, all the time. There's things going on around us all the time. They do not, they do not evoke responses all the time. It's impossible for you guys to be able to get, you know, a response for everything type of thing that's going on around you. That's, that's just not possible. You guys will only engage in, in, in um, you guys will only respond to stimuli, stimuli that's currently in front of you and or is currently has some type of effect on your behavior. That's when you see responses, right? So what I'm trying to say is that whole definition of saying anything, you know, around you, uh, everything that you see, that's absolutely not true. Uh, it's basically all stimuli that affect behavior in a given moment. You see that? So that's the difference. So it's basically any stimuli that actually changes, right, your responses. It's not just any stimuli. It's just not possible. You can't do that. You cannot respond to everything that's around you. So at the end of the day, it comes down to that. So, um, you know, overall, you know, here you need to consider the fact that once again, it's you have things that are going on. Now, things to consider, right? Because there's different things to, to consider in regards to, to, to stimulus, right? Or stimuli. So you have, so stimulus you have, uh, they can affect your eyes, right? Your ears, your mouth, your skin inside your body right and sometimes we have situations such as sensory or sensory detectors right um, you know sensory neurons right sensory receptors so I think receptors um, sound waves right Sound waves. We're sensitive, right, to, to certain sound waves, certain response, uh, certain things that evoke certain stimuli that evoke things. Now, one thing to consider that's really important is the fact that it's only when you have something that affects your behavior, it is only when it actually affects your behavior that something is considered stimuli. Does that make sense? So it's only when you're able to, you know, have some type of, you know, something that affects your 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 response, right, your your rate of responding. Is that some? It is only until then that something is considered stimuli. Other than that, it's just there. It's, it's really not having any kind of effect on you. So at the end of the day, you know that's that's what it, really what it comes down to. Okay. Uh, Ritz, does that look better there? Okay, perfect. So once again, I am more or less blowing your, 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 your mind a little bit, changing, you know, the way that a lot of people talk about, you know, uh, environment. Um, you know, people, once again, put a very general way of saying, and that's a lazy way of, of really, you know, analyzing and looking at environment. You need to look at really the stimuli that have an effect on, on behavior, right? That's it. Nothing else really matters. We can go in circles around, you know, finding different ways to look at it. But really what it comes down to is this right here. You know, anything, any stimulus, right, that affects eyes, ears, mouth, skin, inside, anything, right, that affects that, okay? You even have the sensory detectors, right, that, we're sens uh, that, in that we have certain responses to, okay? So when you listen to music, for instance, right? Okay. Let me see if there's anything else. Um, so, yeah, we kind of got into stimulus. Um, okay, stimulus class. All right. Any questions so far uh, about you know the the stuff that I mentioned right now about environment? Because I know that's very different. A lot of you know once again this is this is not your typical you know way of viewing uh, you know <laughs> environments. Is not. I'm saying this is this is this is another level. I would say uh, about you know looking at at how the way that the environment works. And uh, if you guys want me to provide more examples, I can give you guys more examples. I'm not sure. Some of you guys are probably still like you know preserving, thinking about it. Just fine. I actually, uh, when I evoke some type of, you know, critical thinking, that's good. <laughs> that's actually a good thing. All right. Okay, so Aya's question. I, I Let me see. What did Aya say, by the way? <laughs> Aya, can you repeat the question? I don't know what's going on right now. I keep going back and forth with this thing, with my computer. You said that responses are evoked by, by consequence. So uh, when you talked, uh, so the first point you mentioned there is it's very important. 
Absolutely. You know, yes. You know, you, you, you are more likely, right, that, you know, to engage in responses that are have been previously having a positive consequence, right? So what you're trying to say here is that, you know, you're, and I, I talked about this last week, right, about behavior, right? Behavior is basically, um, you know, anything, right, you know, that any type of responses, right, that's, that's, uh, that has high probability of occurring, occurring under similar circumstances, correct? So here, that part of it, I think, you know, what you're talking about here covers more on that end. Here what we're talking about, it's more about the environment, right? In which situations you're more likely to see, uh, you know, the difference between what's actually stimuli or stimulus and what's not. And I have to once again emphasize the stimuli is only item or anything that actually changes your behavior. You know what I mean? Like literally right now in my room, I have, I have, you know, I have a red dot right there in front of me. I have a painting actually. And I really don't pay much attention to it during the day. Uh, except when I'm actually like, you know, really bored or, or, you know, don't have anything else to do. I just look at the wall, which is really rare. Uh, I also have, you know, a flower up there, you know, some type of plant that's up there on top of the corner of my room. And honestly, it's there, right? The, but the question here is because that painting is in front of me or because of that plant being right there in the corner, do they really change my behavior? Do they really evoke anything, you know, any kind of changes, any substantial changes on my end? Like, do they actually make me do something? You know, while, like, for instance, I'm talking to you guys, do they actually make me do something different? What do you guys think? So am, am I getting, am I, am, do those items, right, you know, people would say, oh, they're stimuli, yeah, but do they really change my behavior? Do they actually, you know, do they actually make me get up and do something different right now? No, they're just there. They're, they're just there, exactly. The plants are, <laughs> the plant is just there. I also have a fridge next to me, uh, and that fridge is only going to evoke some type of response when? When is that fridge actually going to evoke some type of response? Under what conditions? Yeah, when I'm hungry or thirsty. There you go. So it really depends, right, on, on, on the situation. The fridge is still there, uh, but it's not really going to evoke any kind of response in a given moment, right? And not all the time, uh, unless I'm hungry all the time and thirsty all the time. I'll, I'll be, like, literally just on that fridge all the time. It's not, that's not possible, right? We're engaging in other responses that are more uh, important, right, in a given moment. So what, at the end of the day, really, once again, stimuli, or it, it's really badly defined. People don't understand stimuli. People think that, oh, yeah, stimuli or environments, everything that's around you. But no, it's only the thing that actually has an effect on your behavior, that actually changes your behavior in a given moment. That is considered stimuli, okay? The most important thing here is in a given moment, okay? All right. Uh, does that make sense? Did, did I cover that? And also about your elicited, elicited versus evoking. Elicited is more, you know, responded kind of behavior that you're looking at. You know, uh, operant obviously is the main focal point for us, which is more in the lines of evoking, right? So when you talk about listening, it's more about, you know, the, you know, Pavlov, you know, uh, response, uh, stimuli type of, uh, stimuli response, sorry, SR type of, you know, uh, you know, contingency. But obviously our focal point as behavior analysts, right, is, you know, within, you know, ABA is we focus on operant. So, uh, that's really what it comes down to on, on that end. So I, not, I really couldn't fully understand that, that question, but uh, elicited, once again, it's more respondent, uh, you know, conditioning and um, evoking it's more operant conditioning. All right. Okay. So any other questions about that? Does that make sense? Okay, so your question, if you look at the source of sound because it is, it is too loud, it is responded behavior? Hmm. Well, um, you can argue that, you know, you can argue that more or less it falls within the lines of, you know, definitely some type of respondent uh, conditioning, right? Uh, when you look at babies, for instance, right, babies have no prior history with sounds, correct? So, uh, so in that situation... Uh, and here, you know, you can definitely be able to get more and more and more in depth, right? Uh, the last thing I, I want you guys to do is to get too, too, too confused. But you can argue that any kind of response that you engage in has some type of responding conditioning occurring within it. Why? Because there are some type of, uh, you know, sensory, there's some type of eliciting that occurs, right? In everything you do. But I didn't want to get too, I didn't, I didn't want to get you guys too confused right now. I, I'm more than happy to have a, a, a discussion about, you know, how that works. Right now, the most uh, important thing to remember is that, uh, you know, you have this particular, uh, you know, environments, right, that change your behavior, that evoke something, right? 
think about it from that. End. Don't don't get too caught up with other that. Well, other than that, uh, you are right. There are some some stuff that happens in regards to to eliciting, and I like that you're thinking that way because it does it does happen that way. But for now, for the sense of your your studying wise, I would say keep it simple. Uh, we talk about parsimonious for now as much as possible, so we can be able to uh, you know get some of these things you know uh, done. But I would say review. Uh, page 27, as much as possible. Okay, so moving on to stimulus class. Uh, so what is stimulus class, guys? What What is stimulus class, you know, how, how is that defined? What is a stimulus class? What is stimulus class? Okay, so we said some physical properties, um, similar along a dimension. Yeah, exactly. So basically, it's you know any any stimuli right that we come in contact with that you know we basically um, engage in right where certain responses that that are that fall within the realms of of, of that type of uh, stimuli. Uh, for example, right, uh, this is a very general example that I can give you guys is that let's say that you first learn how to drive a car. Uh, let's say you drive, you learn, you, you learn how to drive a, uh, a small, you know, a small car, right? That's where you basically had your first experience with the car. Then afterwards, you know, you, you're presented with, uh, with, you know, your friend says, Hey, can you drive me home? You know, have too many drinks. Can you, can you drive me home? And their car is actually like a large, you know, pickup car, right? Or pickup truck. And, um, you know, you're like, okay, cool. You know, I'll, I'll drive. So in that situation, right, the you know the the whole aspect of you know stimulus class here, we're looking at the cars, right? The car, the 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 elements, the main core uh, aspects of, of what the car is, it's the same, right? You have you know, the same aspects of what what you have in order to drive a car. You just engage in the same type of responses, just in different types of uh, different type of car, all right? Uh, and that's what happens when you're teaching, uh, you know, different types of skills to your to your uh, to the children you work with. Uh, a lot of times, what happens that is that you have Basically, you know, you, you show you're trying to teach Apple, for example, and you teach Apple with uh, only a 3D photo, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, this is, you know, this kid already learned, he mastered Apple already. But as we know, there's different, there's also red apples, right? There's red apples. There's also small apples. There's large apples. Uh, there's apples on trees. There's apples on table. There's apples everywhere and every and in different types of situations. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it's really important to consider that, right? And here, once again, um, for stimulus class is basically, you know, any group of stimuli that share a predetermined, uh, you know, set of common elements in one or more of these dimensions, right? So that's what it is. And uh, other points that I would like to make to you guys here is the following. So environment, environment, sorry for my typo, environment is both inside and outside. Forgot to mention this earlier. This is very important. Environment is always changing, and no one has the same environment. Before I forget. Okay, so these right here, these three points are 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 very critical, and they still fall once again within this whole aspect of understanding, right? Similar, similar, uh, stimulus class, environment. Here, the most important thing to remember is these these three points, right? You guys would all probably argue that and, and probably agree, right? That environment is both inside and outside, right? Um, you know, your 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 you has you guys have organs, so you guys have you know different body parts, right? Uh, you know, different you know things that are going inside internally, physiologically that evoke responses. Uh, and also, when we we're outside, like I said, right now I have a computer in front of me, and that's evoking the whole response for me to talk to you guys, right? To talk about behavior analysis. So, and then the next one is environment's always changing. You guys agree with that, right? We're always, it's always changing. Uh, that's why I always say that people that have very rigid uh, patterns of responding are not very successful. Uh, why? Because they're not very adaptable to the environment that's always uh, changing. Uh, if you're, you know, flexible, if you learn how to adjust and adapt and you problem solve, that's why I said problem solving is a very critical skill, uh, is definitely that when you're going to be able to address this particular, check off on this particular point where, you know, the environment's always changing. And I don't care, you know, what everyone says, you know, uh, in, in regards to, to uh, you know, if they, you guys, you know, come from the same environment, you guys come from the, from the same home, 
you know, people say, oh, yeah, you know, they're, they're brothers and sisters or, you know, yeah, they're, they're conjoined, you know, twins. So they're going to be exactly the same. And as you guys see that, you guys have probably seen so many, you know, uh, you know, probably videos or, or different types of uh, documentaries where that's not true. You see that, you know, all these, you know, uh, even conjoined twins have, you know, different personalities. They have different sets of, of repertoires. And what it comes down to, it's nothing about the brain. It's nothing about, you know, nothing about, you know, anything outside of the fact that people have different experiences, right? Your type of, you know, experience that you have as individuals growing up is very different from an individual that, you know, from, from you, from me, for instance, or it's very different from even your own siblings, because uh, it's impossible, you know, to be able to, to have exactly the same exact thing. Now, we, you guys may share certain, you know, certain values, right? Certain, certain perspectives about life, but not everything's going to be the same. So that's why it says here, no one has the same environment. Okay. Okay. Moving on to the next thing here. Um, let me see if there's anything else I need to cover on that end. Okay, we're going to talk about Okay, any questions so far by the way? Are there any any general questions you guys have? All right, so I'm reading here on page 28. Um there's formal dimensions of stimuli. So we have temporal loci stimuli, so here, let's talk about this one here. This is very simple. Okay, it's a temporal, temporal. Okay, temporal uh, uh, loci, stimuli. So what does that mean? What is that? What does that mean, temporal loci? Any idea what that means? If you guys don't know, just say, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. So I see across time, I see behavior is affected by changes in the environment, time. Okay. So here we go. Very simple. Just remember this right here. Okay. And to see the behavior consequence, A, B, C. That's really what it's talking about, okay? So basically, when you look at you know anything in regards to that you know stimuli, you're looking at once again the 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 way where you're you're looking at the consequence, right? You're looking at the consequence. You're also looking at this right here. You have to see it in the consequences, okay? So when you guys review that, just remember that. All right, just make note of that, okay? Moving on to the next one is behavioral. There's another section here that talks about behavioral func uh, functions. I Functions of stimulus change changes. Okay, behavioral functions of stimulus changes. All right. Okay, so here um, they talk a little bit about different. They're t talking about different things. They're talking about antecedents. Um, you know, evoke responses. They're also talking about consequence stimulus. Based on uh, reinforcement. They're also talking about SDs here, you know, some type of discrimin uh, stimulus control. And really important here, they're talking about also function altering, uh, which is all about the MOs. Okay. So here it talks about, you know, it starts now introducing, um, you know, definitely the whole aspect of MLs to the, to the contingency. So here, uh, temporal loci is still not doing that. It's more about, you know, ABC. Now we actually start doing the four-term contingency, right, that people, that you guys should be familiar now, now with, right? MOs, you know, we got the A, the B, and the C, right? Uh, so more or less that's what it does. And it talks a little bit about stimulus control, right? Stimulus control. Aye, I'm really off today. Okay. So more or less, just make note of that on your on your notes. So when you review that section, make sure to remember that. Uh, 
I'm not going to get too much into respondent behavior. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to skip that area a little bit because I want to get more into the, the the one that we do talk about all the time and we focus on, which is operant behavior. Okay. So, what is operant behavior, by the way? What is operant behavior? What is operant behavior? What is operant behavior, guys? Okay, so Ritz said behavior uh, that is from based on learning history, good. Uh, behavior that is maintained by consequences that follow, conditioned responses, behavior under the control of a contingency. So I, I think that uh, so far, you know, the, the, the one that talks about consequences and also contingency are, are very, very good. Um, you know, and basically here uh, we talk about <clears throat> This is this is the way that it, it, I view it as basically behavior uh, that operates, um, not like operating uh, like at a you know hospital, but operating uh, in environments, right? An environment, okay. So uh, definitely more or less, right? We are engaging in, in this type of behavior all the time, right? You know, uh, it's basically everything we do, right? It's this is the focal point. That's why I'm saying that operant behavior is the main focal point for us. Um, that that's the behavior that you guys, the type of behavior that you guys study, right? That you guys are looking at in regards to your, uh, when you're working with your clients. Okay. So that's really the, the, the main thing here, uh, is, uh, the fact that like you guys mentioned, uh, under control of contingency con consequences, et cetera. I'm looking if there's anything else here that I would like to add to that. Okay. I don't think so. Now, here is where, where I'm going to give you guys something a little bit hopefully different. So selection by consequences. Okay. Selection by consequences. And I think that was, uh, you know, talked about earlier by, by Aya. But I'm curious to know, what do you guys know about selection by consequences? What does that mean, selection by consequences? Okay, so so B. F. Skinner um, had studied studied um, um, Darwinian the uh, Darwin's uh, you know work really really closely. Um, you know he he definitely studied uh, uh, you know Darwin extensively actually, and um, you know when he came up with the whole idea of uh, you know the whole uh, principles of reinforcement. And all the stuff that we learned, right? Uh, he had this in mind that basically is survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest means um, that basically, on our terms, is behavior that um, is most fit. And I'm going to put here most likely to contact reinforcement is most likely to survive. Or in our terms, occur again. Okay, so that's really what it is. Basically, that that you know the whole analogy of natural selection, right? Uh, you know, here you have you know different responses that occur in an environment, right? You guys probably you know do that, right? We all you know engage in behavior, and we engage in behavior, right? That's most uh, the most likely to be reinforced, right? Is most likely to survive, um, you know, and behavior that's extinguished, right? Behavior that's extinguished. Uh, that goes unnoticed or, or is not really, uh, you know, has any kind of uh, reinforcement is less likely to occur. So that's really what it what it came down to. The fact that you know, from Skinner's perspective, he really wanted us to view our our our, our whole aspect of uh, the phenomena of behavior as scientists, right? And this is more or less what when uh, you know the closest thing that came you know on his end to the whole analogy of natural selection. Okay. So when you guys, uh, you know, think about this, remember that. I want you guys to think about this whole aspect, right, the analogy of natural selection, you know, that only the fittest behavior, the one that has the most reinforcement is most likely to survive, right? Okay, so that's more or less what that talks about. 
Uh, let's see if I move on to the next sections here. And uh, the next one is actually operating conditioning. So um, what is operating conditioning? What is operating conditioning? What is operant conditioning? Okay, so basically through consequences. And um, overall, what's going to happen is that when you guys study, when you guys uh, review Skinner's work, I always say that the biggest contribution he had, you know, to our to anything, right, in, in general, all his work was this right here, operant conditioning. Uh, before Skinner, you know, came along, we had, you know, stimulus response, right? We have respondent uh, type of conditioning that people were studying a lot, right? And the reality is that uh, we cannot be able to account for, for most behavior this way, right? As I, I told you guys, most of the behavior that we're looking at has to do with operant conditioning, right? So for that reason, when you guys are working in the field and you guys are, are yourselves, even in your own lives, you guys are coming in contact with this type of, you know, this type of conditioning, right? So... Uh, when mom and dad, you know, uh, got you guys your 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 preferred, you know, uh, uh, items after engaging in certain certain, you know, good deeds at home, uh, you're more likely to to continue uh, doing it, right? Um, and the same can go with punishment. That if you were able to avoid a reprimand from mom or dad because you did not clean your room, you're more likely to clean your room. So we talked about that school reinforcement and uh, punishment, but they're nonetheless are consequences, right? So. It's very important to remember that there that consequence is not only reinforcement, but it's also punishment, right? And for those that were in my class, you guys were able to really get a bit more in depth about that. Uh, so don't don't forget that you know we need to consider once again the whole aspect of punishment when we talk about behavior, right? All right. So moving on to the next section or the next part here is page thirty four. Um, let me see here. Page thirty four has reinforcer. So reinforcer. So, uh, what is reinforcer, by the way? What is reinforcer? What is reinforcer? Yes, Oscar. So you said a stimulus that that increases future probability of behavior. Thank you, Judy. So good, good right there. So future probability, and some of you guys are responding with frequency, um, and I and I did talk about the the issue with that, right? I did talk about why we should not be responding with. Uh, actually, did I talk to you guys about that last? I'm probably talking about because uh, I, I just lecture actually. I just lectured uh, last week. I think I was talking to another class actually. But the reason why it's not good to talk about uh, frequency is because you reinforce more than frequency. Let's think about things that you we reinforce outside of frequency. What else do we reinforce outside of frequency? When you guys are, are, are working with you know with individuals, what are some other, some other you know um, dimensions or other elements that, that that we reinforce when you're working? Good, right? So you said duration. What else do we reinforce? Let's think about this more. Intensity, good. Magnitude, excellent. Okay, great. So you you see there that uh, when you talk about only frequency, you cannot do that because it's uh it, you know Judy said topography good. So there's different elements that we actually you know uh, reinforce not just frequency. So please make sure not to include that anymore on your definition. Uh, just in general, uh, when you talk about reinforcers, right, is basically that you're 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 looking at uh, any stimuli, right, that increases the likelihood of certain uh, uh, similar responses under similar circumstances, right. In this situation, you know, we're looking at more than just frequency. We're looking at other aspects of behavior, okay? But that's not, that's, that's, uh, I, I, I want to reiterate that most people in our field get that really, really, like, they get it wrong most of the time. So don't feel like, I, I want, I want to make sure I shape, you know, good behavior here with you guys. And I want you guys to be really analytical about, you know, some of these descriptions. Uh, let's see here. What else we have? So we have consequences can affect only future behavior. Uh, so they, they start getting into, so that's on page 34. So that's true, right? As you guys know, that once a behavior occurs, it's already uh, occurred. You really cannot do much about it, right? You can only focus on, it's a given that you're going to focus on future, you know, behavior, right? So I'm not going to get too much into that because that's pretty straightforward. Uh, consequences select response classes, not individual responses, which we talked about. The fact that, you know, uh, the consequences are more based on a certain type of responses, right? That, you know, more or less, you know, 
have you know very specific type of consequences, right? So it's an infinity of of, of, of examples that you can find in your in your daily lives, right? Um, let's see what else. So well, let me ask you guys a question about that. Um, can you guys give me some examples of that particular statement there? So consequences select responses, uh, response classes, not individual responses. Guys, so uh, consequences select responses, uh, not individual responses. So what are, what, are, what are some examples that you guys can think about that? I can think of a million right now, actually. I want to see if you guys can think of some on your end. And about the question about when to use Cooper book and when not to use, um, my end, I would say like, you know, I, I would say <laughs> think about it. Think about what I just told you. And more than likely, you guys will see what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I, I I think that overall, like, you know, there's 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 a lot of good things in Cooper book. That's why I always say that a lot of times what happens, you know, um, you know, we present, you know, Cooper book, but there's other other types of um other types of you know literature out there that also provide a different perspective right uh from my perspective I, if you guys kind of you guys kind of saw my explanation about it you guys can kind of see that it's 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 more or less hitting the mark in regards to that so i would say use my 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 end in regards to what i am explaining to you guys okay so i'll ask the question again so give me examples of uh consequences selecting Response classes in your daily lives, yeah, give me some examples of that. you know I mean you guys should be able to come out with a bunch of those I All right, so, all right, cool. Judy said opening the door. That's a good one. Uh, I mean, think about the fact that I can open the door with my eyes closed. I can open the door uh, with my uh, elbow. Um, you know, I can open the door with uh, my left hand, my red, right hand. There are so many things, ways I can open the door. Red said my car only starts when I engage in a certain set of behaviors. So answering the phone, I can answer the phone, you know, while I'm at bed. I, uh, when I'm, you know, once again with one eye open. Um, so pretty much, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of situations where you do, you know, you see that, right. You see the fact that there's going to be things where, where there's different ways in which you respond and you basically, you know, you're able to, uh, get some type of, you know, consequence and accomplish something in, in, in that particular situation. Right. All right. So. And, and Ritz, I'm sorry, I couldn't really understand your, I'm not sure if you said if that was a question or you're providing us an example. Uh, you said my car only starts when I engage in a certain set of behaviors. So I'm assuming that when you start your car, you have to like, you know, put on certain, you know, uh, press certain, like certain, you know, a button, right. Or, or, you know, turn on a certain way. Uh, but sometimes, you know, your positioning, right. You might be a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right. You're, you might have, you know, your, your, uh, a bit more pressure with your jacket, less, no jacket. It really changes, right? It varies. At the end of the day, you're still trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to turn your car on. So I hope that makes sense there. But good, good, good examples there. So Oscar says saying hello. I can say hola. Uh, I can say hi. Uh, there's so many ways, right, that you can be able to, to say hello in, in different tones, right? Um, at the end of the day, that's what we're doing here. All right. Uh, says here, immediate consequences have the greatest uh, effect. Um, so in regards to immediate consequences, um, having the greatest effect, what do they mean by that? What are they talking about in regards to immediate consequences having the greatest effect? And once again, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of, of immediacy, by the way, because uh, I did talk about that. I think uh, the fact that it's very, very subjective. Okay, so here Rich said, the bigger the time delay, the less likely uh, it's operating as a reinforcer. Okay. Aye. 
yeah, so uh, uh, Judy said that, and analog of reinforcement. And just bear in mind that that you know uh, us ourselves, right? As as uh, you know, as as verbal verbal uh, uh, humans, you know, uh, that, that have pretty extensive vocal verbal repertoire, verbal behavior. You know, we can technically speaking be able to to operate right without needing immediate or you know, pretty much uh, reinforcement all the time. In other words, you know, you don't you don't need to have someone clapping for you all the time or or saying great job or you know great. I like how you're doing this. How are you doing that? That's there's no need for that, right? Uh, you know, you guys that went to grad school, it's a really great exa example of that uh, you're not going to see a diploma on, 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 on your first response, right? You're not going to see, you know, you walking down the, the you know, down the, the graduation uh, cer ceremony on your first attempt. Uh, it, it's, it's something that requires a, a whole process, right? So the whole aspect of, uh, of, you know, that keeps you going is your own verbal behavior, right? You're, you're the analog that we talked about, Judy's mentioning there. The fact that you talk to yourself, you're okay. You say it to yourself, I'm, "If I continue doing this, I continue responding. Eventually, I'm going to be able to come in contact with these different types of, uh, you know, reinforcers, right?" So that's really what it is. Now, for individuals that don't have the same type of verbal behavior, um, you know, such as you know, uh, rats uh, or an organism, rats, pigeons, um, infants, uh, uh, children with autism that have no verbal behavior, you do need to provide, you know, a lot more. Uh, reinforcement and it has to be delivered really really quickly like within a few seconds right and eventually you start um you know doing what what do you do when you try to go away from providing reinforcement uh you know as fast as that when, what, what do you start doing what is that called when you start working with your schedule reinforcement there you go i so you say schedule thinning exactly so you start doing that but if at first you do provide some continuous reinforcement uh you must start out with the fixed ratio one fr2 you start going into your uh intermediate uh schedules reinforcement uh, and that's how you're able to eventually thin out the schedule. But at first, it is necessary to start off really with a lot of reinforcement and it has to be delivered really quickly. Okay. Uh, the next one, the next point that is mentioned here on page 36 is consequences. Select any behavior. Select any behavior. Okay. And um, what do you guys think they mean by that when they say consequences select any behavior? What do you guys think about that? What do you, what do they mean by select any behavior? Good, right? So I like that one. That's that's a good one there. So it can be either intended behavior or not. Good. So I guess I guess a good way to put it is that um, you know it doesn't really matter uh, you know what kind of behavior it is if it's good or bad, right? And you guys are, are have seen testament of this, you know, proof of this. And uh, when you work with uh, you know the individuals we work with, a lot of the behaviors you walk into that you start you know uh, working on have a long history of reinforcement, right? So basically, there. Uh, it doesn't matter the behavior is 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 uh, not the best of behavior that you want to see, but it's nonetheless it's been reinforced. So in that situation, the consequences, the reinforcement has been delivered, and that's why you see more of that behavior. So what they're trying to say here is that there's equal opportunity, right? Uh, op equal opportunity consequences for consequences. Okay, does that make sense? So there's equal opportunity for both good and bad behavior to continue being reinforced. All right, so. I hope that makes sense right there, because that's a really important thing to mention. A lot of times, you know, uh, when people talk about reinforcement, they think it's all synonymous with only positive behavior, and that you know, you, oh, it's only going to be all about the, the 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 good stuff. But unfortunately, as you guys can tell, a lot of times, you know, parents, right, even ourselves, right, we reinforce some of the wrong behaviors, right, uh, and that's not that's that's something that is just a given. It's it's just the fact that there's equal opportunity for both the you know the the positive and not so positive behavior to come in contact with those consequences. All right, moving on to the next uh, point here is operant conditioning occurs automatically. Okay, what do you guys think they, they, they're referring to that? You know, when they say operant conditioning occurs automatically.
Very good, Philip. I like that. So basically you're, you're saying, uh, and also Oscar, all of you guys are saying that, that, you know, the individual doesn't need to be aware, right, of uh, the fact that there is reinforcement going on. You guys, uh, before you started studying behavior analysis, you guys had no clue about, you know, reinforcement. I had no clue about reinforcement before I started studying behavior analysis. And nonetheless, reinforcement was there, right? We look back in our, in our when, you know, we're younger, our, our families, right, you know, or not only reinforcement, but also like, you know, uh, uh, punishment, right? Uh, these consequences were always there in our lives, but we were not, you know, uh, uh, you know, we we're not aware. Uh, I have to say that, you know, all of us in this, in this, uh, in this group right here, we're more, we're lucky because, you know, more or less, you know, the, the, the inadvertently, the, the consequences that our parents provided us, you know, le have led us to, to, to be successful, right? Uh, all of you guys are, are either in school right now. All of you guys are contributing, you know, positively to society. All of you guys are doing something good. And that in itself, you know, doesn't mean that you had to have, you know, some, uh, a parent that had the knowledge of behavior analysis, uh, no, they just basically, you, you were fortunate uh, to have either parents or someone in your, in your life that was positive influence for you to, to get there. Right. But nonetheless, you know, reinforcement was operating there. There was some type of like, you know, consequences that kept you going. Right. So that's, that's definitely uh, a really important thing to, to make note of. All right. So let me see if there's anything else I need to cover on this end. Mm. I'm going to see here. So. I'm not going to get too much into uh, reinforcement and posit, uh, basically reinforcement and punishment yet. I'm probably going to save that for another lecture or another opportunity to talk to you guys about these things. Um, okay, so I think that's those are the main areas that I wanted to cover with you guys. I uh, just wanted to like you know reiterate that that uh, uh, you know these are the main points. The, there's a reinforcement chapter. There's a punishment chapter that we're going to get into later. There's also an extinction chapter. All of that is stuff that we're going to get into later. Uh, the main things that I wanted you guys to like, you know, uh, take are, are here. Uh, you know, these different, these different, um, you know, pretty much points that, that I made here. Um, and the next, uh, the next uh, opportunity, we're gonna actually talk about. Let's see here, we're gonna talk about uh, target behavior selecting, which I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I should get into that because honestly, some of you guys already have experience uh, conducting FBAs. I want to get more on the conceptual, uh, conceptual uh, lecture conceptual conceptual uh, lecture on, on things uh, let me see here what is a group thing would you guys like for me to talk about you know selecting and defining target behaviors for chapter three or should we skip that chapter what is a group you know vote for those in favor okay so I say yes so yes say yes or no Ritz is saying yes okay All right, John is saying yes. All right, cool. So we can, I'm sh okay, that's fine. I can get into chapter three. We'll just keep it going. Because I, um, I say you guys have a lot of experience, you know, doing F uh, FBAs, but I can definitely get a bit more in depth about, you know, some of these uh, uh, things that are related to, to FBAs. So um, let me look at the, the uh, what's it called? The task list here. So we covered, yeah, we covered most of this. Okay, so we're good. All right. So, any questions before I let you guys go? I mean, uh, I think we're pretty much done for for today. Any questions before I let you guys go on chapter two? All right. Sounds good, guys. So uh, it's nice talking to you guys. You know, have a great rest of the day. And uh, if there's any questions, you guys can always email me too. And I can be able to respond to you guys uh, as soon as possible. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for, for showing up today. And uh, I'll see you guys next week. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye.